I have great pleasure in inviting our eminent faculty and delegates from all over the world. My colleagues, Dr. Gokul, Satya, Yogesh, Prasad, and Sabri, they join me in welcoming all of you. During pandemic, we were wondering how we want, how we will be educating ourselves, and we want to have some novel idea instead of the regular didactic lecture or how do I do or some kind of symposium. Then suddenly we got an idea that why not we discuss about the landmark publications in gastroenterology and the two ten most impactful landmark publications in gastroenterology. And we designed eight editions in this webinar series. First of all, being the national faculty being focused. And the last four will be the international webinar. This is what we planned it. And seeing the success of the first webinar and being attended over 3,000 uh, delegates from all over the world, we were encouraged to do further webinars here in this program. These webinars have been organized by Medindia Hospitals and Academy, Chennai, which is affiliated to the prestigious State Medical University. And very glad to tell you that these webinars have been accredited by Tamil Nadu Medical Council with the credit hours. And then further immensely pleased to announce here that these webinars have been endorsed by American College of Gastroenterology and American Society for GI Endoscopy. The first edition was on comprehensive aspects of gastroenterology and uh, it was very successful. And the second edition was on luminal disorders, predominantly the small bubble diseases. And the third webinar was on pancreatic endotherapy and pancreatitis. We had eminent national faculty. The only problem they said is it is very challenging to prepare these lectures because it is not a regular lecture and it has to be different from there. They had to really work hard at least a week or so uh, to prepare these lectures. But at the end, they said they enjoyed these lectures. And um, I did realize that, but when I was forced to do my lecture this time, I appreciated much more than what I realized it. It's a tough job to bring in 10 landmark publications in gastroenterology. And the fourth edition was on uh, liver diseases, hepatology. And the fifth edition uh, in this series was uh, being the international webinar. We had Dr. Nuria Udo from Japan talking on advanced endoscopy imaging and John Salzman from USA talking delivering the lecture on non variceal GI bleed. It was ably managed, moderated by Nalini Guda from Milwaukee and Vivek Kaul from New York and the moderator being our Indian Society of Gastroenterology President, Dr. Vivek Saraswar. And the sixth edition is, was held on December 12th. It was on diseases like GRD and Barrett's esophagus by Pratik Sharma from Kansas Medical University and bariatric treatment by Dr. Neto from Brazil and moderated by Dr. Prasad Iyer from Mayo Clinic, Rochester, and we had other eminent national faculty too. Our last edition in this webinar series is going to be held on 20th of February. This will be a very exciting webinar because the third space on endoscopy and the lecture will be delivered by Noria Fukami from Mayo Clinic, Arizona, and interventional U.S. by Professor Kenneth Binmola uh, from USA. And we have great panelists, Dr. Amitabh Chak, who is the Secretary General of ASGE, and Mustafa Ibrahim from uh, Egypt, who is the chairman of ASGE International Committee. And we have two eminent national faculty, uh, Dr. Amal Bapai and Dr. Sandeep Lakthakia, is the Secretary General of Society of GI Endoscopy of India. And another great news to inform you here is our great friend, Dr. Douglas Dex, who will be the president-elect of as ASGE will be delivering the keynote address on the same webinar next year, next month. 
and he'll be talking on colonoscopy today and tomorrow. And those who have missed it or those who want to see it, these webinars again, they can watch them on YouTube link given here. And we are going to have the proceedings of the eight webinar series will be published as a book. And this book will be given as a complimentary copy to uh, all the uh, members of Indian Society of Gastroenterology and ACG and ASG members of India and Southeast Asia. This is what we have made arrangements for this. And those Indian delegates can get the credit hours certificate from Tamil Nadu Medical Council here at the E certificate. They can get it, download it from the virtual platform you have created. They can click here for webinar. And the most important is they want to download all the certificate here. They can download the certificate from this and clicking on that, they will get all eight webinar certificate. If you have attended or if you are registered only. And this has been possible uh, with the support and academic inputs from my colleagues, Dr. Gokul, Raja, Satya, Prasad, TNS, and Sabari. And this program would not have been possible with the academic I mean, grants given by my, our academy partner, Micro Knowledge Academy. And every year we have this event, Annual Med India Oration Award. And this will be uh, coupled with this uh, today's webinar. The previous award is being Dr. Devier uh, from Belgium, Dong Wan Siu from South Korea, Philip Chu from Hong Kong, Chris Kaur from Singapore, and Pichumani from USA, and uh, uh, Ping Zhong Zhou from China. This year, the governing body of Med India Academy has unanimously selected Professor David Greenwald, who is the current president of American College of Gastroenterology in recognition of his outstanding and pioneering contributions to the field of gastroenterology. At the end of the oration, we'll have the great honor in presenting a citation plaque and medal to him. Uh, please accept it, sir. And coming to this webinar, after the oration, we'll have the first lecture by Professor Todd, Todd Barron. You know that he is the most eminent endoscopist in the world currently now. And he is going to deliver the disease on biliary endotherapy. And it so happened that everyone liked the biliary endotherapy so much. The second uh, the talk also by me on biliary endotherapy. This is just to show you that how two people can who are uh, passionately involved in endotherapy, we look at the landmark publication. So this is going to be like a, a one uh, seeing in uh, one angle, another in another perspective. So we'll enjoy. This is the first time we have decided to do this because biliary endotherapy is being practiced widely across the globe. So this is such an important topic. We cannot confine in one, uh, I mean, a matter of 10 publications. So uh, Dr. Uh, Tad Barron has viewed the bleary endotherapy in one angle. I am going to view in another angle. So you will enjoy the webinar. This is a first of its kind. We thought this is not a competition or debate. This is looking at the perspective in different angle. And we have very eminent panelists which whom will be introduced now. And whole thing is being coordinated by my colleague and my associate, Dr. Raja Yogesh here. Now, before starting the proceeding, I have great pleasure in introducing Professor Joe Solano, Jr. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Santo Tomas, Manila, the Philippines, founder of the IBD Club of the Philippines, and past president of Asia Pacific Association for the Study of Liver, Philippine Society of Gastroenterology. He's all our, uh, the bad data of all our panels are so much and I will not be able to complete it. But only thing I can tell you here is, apart from the A's endoscopies, all the panelists and the moderator and speakers, one important qualification, apart from being a skilled endoscopist, they are all very great human beings. This is one thing I can tell you that. And now I have a, a great pleasure introducing my good friend, Professor Dr. Randir Sood. Randir Sood is the chairman Gastroenterology Division, Medanda Medicity is one of the leading hospitals in North India. I can easily tell you with his rich experience of 35 years in biliary endotherapy, 
He is one of the pioneers in India in biliary endotherapy. He is the former president of Society of GI Endoscopy of India, and he is the recipient of the Padma Sri Award. He is the fourth highest civilian award by the President of India, and we welcome you, Dr. Solano and Dr. Randir, to this uh, August gathering and the meeting. I have great pleasure in introducing. Dr. Prof. I mean uh, the Murthy Badiga. He had his advanced endoscopy training in the University of Amsterdam. He always tells me that the greatest damage happened in in, my, in his life is in Amsterdam because he met me there when I also went there as a short term trainee in Amsterdam. And he's so knowledgeable. You can discuss anything under the sun. He's a great conversationist. is not only interested in endoscopy is interested in politics and economy i always uh, uh, tell him that he would have done a great politician also he is a consultant doctors hospital at renaissance texas and president interventional gastroenterologist of rgv gastro texas he is a clinical associate professor ut rgv texas usa we welcome you dr murthy badiga i hope you logged in Otherwise, I want to introduce you next. And Dr. Murthy, you are there. Yes. Yeah, I'm glad that the damage is still there now. <laughs> And I want to introduce my senior colleague, Professor Dr. K. R. Palani Sami. He is the founder and former head Department of Gastroenterology, Stanley Medical College, Chennai. He is the former president of uh, Society of GI Endoscopy of India and Indian Society of Gastroenterology. he is also padma shri awardee and i already told you what means padma shri award in india he is currently the head of the department of gastroenterology apollo main hospital chennai for the time being i just say thank you uh, for this um, uh, for spending time with us for this wonderful webinar and our delegates are delighted and excited to listen to all of you and uh, i just start the next proceeding now is my great pleasure uh, to call upon professor joe solano who will be introducing the our awardee medinda oration awardee i introduce the oration topic then uh, following which professor david greenwald will be delivering his oration at the end of the oration we will do the the presentation ceremony after that followed by the two lectures and after that we'll have the the uh, panel discussion and question answer session thank you very much over to professor dr jo solano junior thank you very much and congratulations uh, for this uh, very good webinar that you have developed uh, dr chandra sekar it's nice to have met you years ago and now we're still uh, continuing our friendship uh, the next speaker of course is a very famous uh, endoscopist and gastroenterologist I always joined the New York uh, Society of Gastroenterology and Endoscopy uh, live webinars or live sessions in New York uh, every year and uh, except that uh, last year there was this covid thing that uh, prevented me from going there so I I'm very very happy to see him today and give a talk. Uh, our speaker for the mid in the mid India oration for 2021 is the current director of clinical gastroenterology and endoscopy at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. He is also professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Currently, he is the president of the American College of Gastroenterology and has been awarded as master endoscopist in of the ASGE in 2006 and master of the ASGE uh, last year. He also chairs the research committee of GI Quick, which is the GI Quality Improvement Consortium, and a member of the steering committee of the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. It gives me great pleasure to welcome for you, ladies and gentlemen, to give the 2021 Med India Oration, Professor David Greenwald. Professor Greenwald, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Solano. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you very much. It appears that someone else is sharing a screen and apparently you need to stop that before I can share mine. There we go. 
Yes, well, thanks so much for that very kind introduction, Dr. Salerno and Dr. Chandra Sakar. And it's a real honor to be here this morning, both to join all of you and to be able to give the Med India oration. So my name is David Greenwald. I'm currently the president of the American College of Gastroenterology and proud to represent the HCG at this superb meeting and terrific webinar series. Dr. Chandra Sakar invited me and I thank him. He's honored me by asking me to deliver the Med India oration this year, and I'm honored to do that. As you all know, Dr. Chandra Sakar is chairman of Med India Hospitals in Chennai and is um, a re the recipient recently of the ACG's Community Service Award. He's also past president of the Indian Society of Gastroenterology and the Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy of India. Dr. Chandra Sakar asked me to speak about shifting paradigms in GI care. And with COVID shifting everything, that is what I will address. In fact, I'd like to address several very important ways that the COVID-19 pandemic has shifted paradigms in GI care. This will include endoscopic services and outpatient services, which impact our evaluation and scheduling of our procedures. I'd also like to touch on colonoscopic training and finish up with some words on vaccines. So let's start with where we are today, January 23rd, and in short, it's not good. Worldwide cases are just about to cross 100 million and deaths that can be counted are greater than 2 million. The map in the middle shows worldwide distribution with still significant red, meaning bad, in both the United States and India, as well as much of Europe. Here's a closer look at the United States, also not good. Nearly 25 million cases and over 400,000 deaths. The distribution across the country is broad and New York, where I work, remains with the most deaths of any state in the United States, much of that coming early on in the pandemic. And these are data on the seven day moving average of new cases. The green line at the top and unfortunately rising very steeply until recently was the United States. India shown in a dark green line with has a peak in September and a steady decline since then. So it's been just over a year now since we first heard about this novel coronavirus pictured schematically in the upper right. The virus was isolated in rapid sequence in January 2020, first isolated, the genome then sequenced and it was named. Parenthetically, vaccine developed started almost immediately. The clinical manifestations, including diffuse pneumonia, were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in January. We learned quickly about the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2, which seemed to be similar to that of previous coronaviruses and greater than the seasonal influenza virus. And we learned in real time each day as the seeming tsunami pictured on the lower left crashed into New York. We learned from our scientists and we learned from the lay press, like here, the New York Times, explaining spike proteins and ACE2 receptors to a public that was hungry for information about the cause of this growing pandemic. And we learned from the past. Here's a look at the 1918 flu pandemic and the value of measures like social distancing and mask wearing and how these simple tactics could have a great impact on mortality. <laughs> So let's turn to COVID-19 and colonoscopy. Many studies and data sets show a dramatic decline in endoscopic volume throughout the pandemic with a very sharp drop at the outset. Indeed, an international survey study of 250 centers worldwide uh, showed an 83% reduction in endoscopic volume and that was seen worldwide. Initially, much of the drop in volume was a reflection of fear, well-founded fear, of course, and a lack of appropriate PPE. That survey found N95 used to be less than 70% initially in Europe. Another similar study in the UK found procedure volume to be 12% of pre-COVID volume or a drop of 88% stated another way. This drop in volume had and still has a profound effect on our endoscopic capabilities. As everyone around the globe struggled to figure out what to do, we collectively looked for leadership and guidance from our professional organizations, and they responded swiftly. Pictured here are guidelines from the European and American GI societies for endoscopic procedures outlining what procedures were considered urgent and which could be delayed or deferred. 
Indeed, as Dr. Solano just mentioned, I'm proud to say that my regional GI society in New York, the NYSG, rapidly came out with very specific guidelines that greatly helped the community of gastroenterologists in New York hit so hard early by the pandemic. Emergent procedures never stopped, as they couldn't stop. But documents like this helped to provide clear instructions for all of us on how to proceed. In the meantime, it was clear that for endoscopic services to continue, the PPE that we were relying on had to keep us safe and had to be shown to be effective. And by April, thanks to Dr. Ali Rapici and colleagues in Italy, we had just that. In fact, the ACG was fortunate to have Dr. Rapici address the board and tell us about the safety of PPE in Italy. A publication in April showed nearly, in a, nearly 100 I'm sorry, 1,000 healthcare workers in 42 hospitals in Northern Italy showed that only 4% developed COVID, less than 1% were hospitalized, and there were no deaths. It was also clear that most of the illness in healthcare workers came before the introduction of appropriate safety measures. So this was great news. In short, properly worn PPE worked against COVID-19. So how could one choose the appropriate level of PPE in a world without unlimited PPE? Well, I'm very proud of the ACG here as well as the other GI societies for working on specific algorithms to guide decision-making. The ACG algorithm is pictured here and it relies on some knowledge of the relative community prevalence of COVID in a given area, recognizing that the risk changes as the community prevalence changes. And it also uses test results for COVID when available to help guide the proper level of PPE, thereby protecting healthcare workers appropriately while using relatively scarce PPE wisely. We also needed guidance about what to do when healthcare workers were exposed to COVID-19 or their families or close contacts were exposed to COVID-19. And this CDC algorithm depicts exactly that. One of the issues with how COVID-19 has affected colonoscopy and endoscopy is by creating staff shortages when staff are sick or quarantined for an exposure. A few words about endoscopic training, which is a big issue in the fallout of COVID-19. In short, endoscopic training has been severely impacted by COVID with a marked reduction in hands-on training. Our trainees in New York and around the United States and I'm sure around the world are worried and rightly so. It's unclear what the long-term impact will be of this decreased training, but consideration might be given to extra training time. There may also be a role for increased use of simulators, although they're not exactly um, hands-on training. And certainly the pandemic has given rise to massive, a massive rise in virtual education. Witness the ASGE president's fireside chats. Dr. Mergener has done an outstanding job with those this year and the incredibly successful ACG virtual Grand Rounds. So let's turn to the effect of COVID on outpatient practice of gastroenterology, which again was profoundly affected. These are the results of an ACG member survey showing a drop to 38% of prior volume in April of 2020, with only a partial rebound in June of 2020. In fact, Six months after that, outpatient visits remain well below levels of prior years. And I think likely will remain below those levels for some time to come. What took its place is telemedicine, and that is likely to be here to stay. It's very convenient for patients and for many providers, although clearly fraught with issues, including problems with technology. And importantly, I think not everyone has equal access to that needed technology, which raises issues to all of us about worsening equity of access to appropriate gastroenterology care. As someone who witnessed the firsthand the inpatient surge in New York in March, April, and May, I wanna say a few words about isolation and fear. I think they're really important. They're both very real and they have profound effects that persist. COVID patients in the hospital were isolated. They still are isolated and they're isolated from each uh, their families. Unfortunately, many of them died and many of them died alone. The families were unable to be there to comfort their loved ones and help them. Physicians also were isolated from their patients, initially by fear of contracting COVID, again real, and ultimately by PPE. Our wearing masks, gowns, gloves, and face shields 
really separates us from our patients and our inability to do the things we normally do, including just touching people, makes an enormous difference. And finally, recognizing the stress and anxiety that everybody's been under over the past year is critical and we need to meet it head on. Rates of worsening mental illness and suicide, in fact, in healthcare workers are real during the pandemic and, should, and may have a lasting impact. Staff burnout is also real. It's hard, all of you know, and exhausting to work all day in PPE. I've already mentioned staffing issues um, as related to families getting ill, staff getting ill, or the need to be quarantined. Working from home is a frequent occurrence now, and finding the proper work-life equilibrium is difficult, but important. In the end, I think great communication is central to helping with all of this. Open dialogue with other professionals about what their stresses are is critical to helping each other, which has been so important throughout the pandemic. Yes, helping each other is really key, and I can't stress it enough. A few words are also in order about leadership in the pandemic and the new paradigm in GI care. It's easy to become isolated with all these virtual meetings and telehealth, but it's important, maybe more important than ever, to reach out to your colleagues and your staff regularly and take good care of them, as I said. Regular meetings by phone or video platforms such as this are crucial in this new world of gastroenterology. So let's turn to colorectal cancer screening. The chart on the, left, on the left is from the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable and the American Cancer Society, and shows a greater than 90% drop in colon cancer screening colonoscopies in the United States early on in the pandemic, with almost 19,000 missed or delayed diagnoses of colorectal cancer in a three-month period from March to June, representing the result of 1.7 missed colonoscopies in the United States in that three-month period, and that group estimated that there would be 4,500 or more excess deaths from colorectal cancer over the next decade. Those data only covered three months and the pandemic has gone on far longer than that and will continue. So it is certain that these numbers are underestimates. The roundtable responded by issuing four aligning statements reaffirming that colon colorectal cancer screening is important and colorectal cancer remains a public health priority reiterated that colonoscopy remains safe and suggested identifying those should, who should receive higher priority. Recommended that during a time when colonoscopy services may be limited, stool-based testing is certainly an option, and really focused attention on the idea that reigniting momentum and public health messaging around colorectal cancer will be key. We've made great progress in colorectal cancer globally, and the pandemic really threatens it. So here's the American Cancer Society marketing materials and a press release that, um, that highlight three major points. First, don't postpone regular care. Second, resume routine health care. And third, there's a cost in healthcare quality to missing screening activities. Regular cancer screening is still important. And at Mount Sinai in New York, where I work, this is part of what we did. We made a video to reassure our patients that they would be safe before during and after their procedures and pointed everyone who was going to have a procedure to these videos. And finally, let's turn to vaccines. This is truly a triumph of science this year. In less than one year, scientists and colleagues from around the globe went from a novel coronavirus to multiple clinical trials to many candidate vaccines. The steps are outlined here and really show remarkable work. There are several vaccine candidates, each based on different platform technologies, as you all know. The diversification of these platforms really mitigates against the risk of any one vaccine failing. The two that have achieved emergency use authorization in the United States are mRNA vaccines pictured on the left. There are also viral vector vaccines from an adenovirus platform, and these are include the one made by AstraZeneca, which is um, being used in India currently. Finally, there are vaccines based on protein materials, basically killed coronaviruses, and that is also now being used in India. I will go over the data briefly on the two vaccines that have received an, uh, emergency use authorization in the United States. Importantly, both showed 95% efficacy in large clinical trials, which is remarkably high, and have very favorable side effect profiles. Of note, 
in the uh, efficacy in the Pfizer product was over 94% in those over age 65. And in the Moderna manufactured vaccine, there were no people, this is very important, in the vaccine group who developed severe COVID defined as requiring hospitalization or intubation. Both vaccines appear to be quite safe and remarkably effective. But there's still a lot we don't know. How long will protection last? I'd say right now there's good evidence that will last a long time if it's like other coronaviruses. So it's reasonable to be optimistic, but we truly don't know yet because the vaccine, the coronavirus, novel coronavirus has only been around for less than a year. There's no data yet for children or for those who are pregnant or immunocompromised in terms of vaccine. A key question, which I think is crucial now, is whether you can still carry and transmit COVID-19 after successful vaccination. Again, I think reasonable to be optimistic here, but waiting for more guidance. What happens if you opt out and only get one dose of a two dose vaccine? There's some evidence that you get partial immunity, you may become immune, but certainly the vaccine is recommended to be administered as it was studied in the, in the clinical trials. And finally, vaccine hesitancy is a real issue. People are concerned and it's part of our role in the new GI world to know the data and help get out the information to our patients and our colleagues. So here's a communication from all of the United States based GI societies urging members to share their vaccine knowledge and stories with patients, colleagues, family and friends. Indeed vaccinations in the United States are underway and here are photos of my two doses. As of yesterday, close to 19 million doses in the United States um, have been given as a first dose with a new rate now of about 1 million per day. Worldwide, about 60 million first doses have been given as of yesterday. We know that we need about 70 to 85% of the population to be immune for the threat of this virus to diminish significantly. And we can get there with mass vaccination campaigns. One nice thing to come out of the darkness of the pandemic has been a tremendous amount of collaboration between the GI societies in the US and throughout the world. And here you can see several joint communications between the GI societies in the United States. I thank all my colleagues in those organizations for their efforts to work together whenever we can to help our members and our patients. So Dr. Chanda Sakari asked me to talk about the shifting paradigm in GI care and here are the key points. I think the practice of gastroenterology and GI endoscopy has changed dramatically in the past year. I think there's no doubt about that. Many of the changes are likely to persist for a long time. I would say that scientific breakthroughs have been rapid and profound, but I would also say that the impact of COVID-19 on GI and endoscopy will not be fully known for a long time as well. We've discovered that we are resilient, probably more resilient than we thought we were, and also very creative in solving the problems that have come about this past year. And finally, the value of being together, the value of connections, collaboration, and camaraderie has never been more important. And so I leave you with this, one of my favorite images of the past year, a piece of art showing Superman in his cape, saluting the heroes of the year, the true heroes, the many, many heroes of the healthcare world. So I'd again like to thank Dr. Chanda Sakar for inviting me on behalf of the American College of Gastroenterology and honoring me with the Med India oration. And I thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Greenwald for that very insightful and very eloquent talk. Clearly the changing paradigms in this COVID era is really impacting not only us, but clearly also patient and our patient care the quality of the care that we are able to deliver to our patients. I'd like to turn over the screen now to Dr. Chandra Stekar for the award of the citation plaque and the medallion of the Mid-India yeah. Oration to Professor Greenwald. So please, Dr. Chandra Stekar, please. Yeah. So, uh, Professor David Greenwald, I think everyone will agree that this is a need of the hour, exciting talk, and it has a lot of academic inputs, as I said, from very thoughtful uh, design talk to help us all over the world. And the great thing to know is all, how all four societies have gathered and the, uh, unified their thoughts to help in this difficult time. 
thank you very much professor david uh, greenwald for your wonderful oration we have great pleasure and i request all the panelists and speakers to join me in uh, presenting this uh, honor please accept this honor on behalf of the bo uh, board of uh, the governing board of uh, med india academy i am just presenting this so we'll have a virtually present this uh, uh, plaque so i will see the round of applause from my speakers thank you very much uh, this is the uh, citation plaque it reads us in recognition of his outstanding and pioneering contribution to the field of gastroenterology he has been selected and being awarded a med india oration award and he goes into the other uh, the eminent uh, doctors who have received this oration award and along with this there is a medallion which will be the front side will be this uh, this is the med india oration uh, medal and this is the about the our med india academy thank you very uh, much uh, thank you you are telling vanakkam and all so indian way of telling that become very popular in the covid time not shaking hands and uh, i have great pleasure please accept this uh, citation plaque and medal it will be shipped to you uh, in due course of time please accept it and it is again a great honor and pleasure uh, for all of us to have the president of american college of gastroenterology to deliver this prestigious med india oration thank you very much professor david greenwald and with this we will move on to the thank you all very much i really appreciate it we will move on to the med india oration now i will uh, just share the screen uh, we are going to start this uh, the uh, Lord Baron. So he'll be introduced by. I have great pleasure in inviting my friend, Dr. Randir Sud. Uh, to introduce Dr. Todd Baron, Dr. Todd Baron, and introduce the topic. He himself is a master in biliary endotherapy. Dr. Randir Sud, over to you. Thank you, Chandrasekhar, and uh, it's a privilege to introduce a person like uh, Todd Baron, whom I really admire. And uh, this slide, which tells about him, is nothing. In fact, uh, he, uh, you know, according to me, he is a he's an endoscopist who has acquired skills in doing very advanced endoscopic procedures but only 5% of the endoscopists according to me use their hands skillfully and also use their brains better and that the, the you know the evidence of skillful uh, skills he has acquired is uh, available from all the, the videos we see and all the live workshops we have observed and the cases we see during various conferences. But the evidence of his uh, uh, intellect and his uh, analytical mind is there in 600 publications he had in uh, the, of his work. You can imagine that is, having 600 publications is unimaginable. And Todd is not a person who, who, ha who has tremendous time with him. And that's why I consider him as my hero. And he has been awarded the Henry S. Plummer Distinguished Clinician Award and Master Endoscopy Award uh, by ASGE. And he's Professor of Medicine and Director of Advanced Therapeutic Endoscopy at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Over to you, Todd, for uh, the, what is going to be an exciting uh, talk. And uh, nobody can uh, justify this talk better than you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I, I really appreciate it, Ren, here, um, <clears throat> for that wonderful introduction. And I want to thank um, the organization, um, Dr. Shender Shaker, for inviting me. So let me share my screen now. Um, and we'll get 
our lecture on the way. So <clears throat> um, as mentioned before, um, I chose the 10 most impactful landmark publications on biliary diseases, uh, stones and strictures, which will also be covered by TS uh, later. But again, we've chosen, you know, obviously different articles to discuss. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So landmark article one, actually I, I break up into 1A and 1B since these were almost simultaneously uh, put in publication uh, in different journals in 1974. And they're really considered probably one of the, or the most landmark articles in ERCP. Uh, the first by Claussen and Demling, um, and the second by uh, Kawai et al um, on endoscopic sphincterotomy. And both of these were done for management of bile duct stones. Um, in the case of uh, uh, Claussen and Dembling, uh, they performed endoscopic sphincterotomy of the papilla in a 70 year old patient, uh, and then performed a second ERCP to remove a solitary stone using a dormia basket. Um, they pointed out that uh, successful animal experiments that both he and Dr. Uh, Kawai had performed uh, suggest that these minor, uh, what they call minor procedures uh, can be done with an endoscope. Um, again, the second one was by uh, Dr. Kawai uh, which um, was three patients that they performed endoscopic sphincterotomy for impacted bile duct stones uh, that then spontaneously passed. Uh, they used an electrode uh, to perform sphincterotomy, which probably is um, similar in some ways to a needle knife that we use today, although you can see a much thicker wire. So those really were the beginning at least of therapeutic endoscopy uh, from a biliary standpoint. Uh, my second article, uh, which also has to do with bile duct stones, is, uh, was in some ways a controversial article published in the New England Journal of Medicine on endoscopic biliary drainage for severe acute cholangitis published in 1992. And this study had 82 patients with severe cholangitis. Uh, 41 were randomized to undergo ERCP and 41 to undergo open common bile duct exploration, uh, something that you wouldn't even think uh, would be done. And there was some question in some ways about the whether this was really ethical knowing that you could uh, non-invasively or less invasively do this endoscopically. But in the endoscopy or ERCP group, not surprisingly, there was a significantly lower complication rate uh, of 34% versus 66% um, and a significantly lower mortality of 10% versus 32%. Um, so really a, a major milestone in terms of the management of patients with severe cholangitis. We all, also have to remember that in 1992, um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy uh, was really not being performed widely um, and therefore um, open exploration was still uh, the predominant way of managing around the world of common bile duct stones uh, coupled with uh, open cholecystectomy. Uh, the third article I'd like to cover, there's a landmark article is a randomized trial of endoscopic papillary balloon dilation versus endoscopic sphincterotomy for the removal of bile duct stones. This was published in 1997 um, by a case of Bratzi's group in Amsterdam, which in the 80s and, um, and 90s was the predominant, one of the predominant groups of publishing um, high quality studies um, uh, on ERCP and biliary interventions. Um, in this, this case, there were 200 consecutive patients with bile duct stones identified at the time of ERCP. Um, they were randomly assigned sphincterotomy 
or papillary balloon dilation. Uh, patients were observed in the hospital for at least 24 hours and followed up at one and six months. Um, you can see here's the flow chart, pretty much what I said, 218 patients randomized, um, eight were excluded in each group. Uh, so you had 101 in each group, followed for one and six months. Uh, but here are the uh, immediate or, um, outcome and delayed outcome. Pancreatitis was equal in both groups, um, fever in both groups, bleeding was significantly lower, um, as you would imagine. Interestingly, there were two cases of perforation in the uh, balloon dilation group, uh, but overall the total uh, complication rate or what we would call now adverse events was, was lower, um, but not statistically significant in the balloon dilation as composed compared to the uh, sphincterotomy group. Their longer follow-up uh, in terms of recurrent symptoms, uh, recurrent stones, uh, development of acute cholecystitis, um, interestingly, was actually lower in the balloon dilation group than it was in the sphincterotomy group. But overall, total uh, follow-up complications were lower in the balloon dilation group as compared to the sphincterotomy group. So I think this article really at least uh, solidified balloon dilation um, as an alternative to sphincterotomy. I know there are uh, those in the United States that are still reluctant to perform endoscopic uh, balloon dilation because of the fear of pancreatitis based on a subsequent study that was done in the United States. I think that study was really flawed uh, in several ways, which I won't go into, but you also have to remember that was before uh, that, that subsequent study, and, and of course this study, were before the widespread use of uh, rectal non-steroidals um, to prevent post ERCP pancreatitis, and before the adoption of uh, temporary pancreatic stents also to prevent post ERCP pancreatitis. So in those endoscopists that have a concern uh, for uh, post ERCP pancreatitis, I think uh, at least we can uh, be more comfortable with performing balloon dilation. I can tell you that in my own practice, I do not hesitate to perform it in those patients who have contraindications um, to undergoing uh, sphincterotomy because of coagulopathy or um, antithrombotic medications. Um, so my landmark article number four is really just a case report, but was really the first uh, report by Nipsuhendra of placing um, a stent in the bile duct uh, for palliation of malignant biliary obstruction. And this was um, published in 1979. Um, they, they, based, they described an endoscopic method for placing an internal drain. Um, others had, per, had described uh, nasal biliary suction, uh, but not internal stenting. Um, and obviously they demonstrated the advantages of having an internal drain. Um, and for high risk cases, what's interesting is their conclusion was, it can be considered as an alternative to colonoclonostomy which is obviously was done then surgically and not endoscopically, uh, but it's interesting how uh, the world has changed and it's almost coming all the way back around to performing uh, things like colonoclonostomy, but with an EUS scope. Um, my landmark article number five um, is a randomized trial of self-expandable metal stents um, versus plastic stents uh, for the relief of malignant biliary obstruction. Um, and this was published um, in 1992, also by Case and Bratzi's group in Amsterdam. Uh, in summary, they had 105 patients with distal unresectable malignant biliary obstruction, and they're randomized uh, 49 under one placement of a self-expandable uncovered metal uh, stint, which was the wall stint, 
which most of you are probably familiar with, uh, which is a, was a stainless steel stent, uh, which is not available uh, anymore uh, with diameters of either eight or 10 millimeters. And 56 underwent placement of a traditional straight plastic 10 French stent. And the median stent patency was significantly prolonged in the metal group, 273 days compared to 126 days. And you can see the Kaplan-Meier curve of stint patency of the first stint. Um, you can see the uh, metal stint in the solid line and the plastic stint in the dotted or broken line of the significant difference, which occurred around uh, 100 days. They also showed, by the way, that uh, with stint occlusion in a second stint, there was almost no uh, second metal stint in the metal stint group and a second plastic stint. Um, the second plastic stint um, had even shorter patency than the first. Uh, the metal stint patients had no um, occlusion with a second metal, metal stint until death. Um, landmark article number six uh, was also published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, which was preoperative biliary drainage for cancer of the head of the pancreas, which is a multi-center multi study um, from the Netherlands. As most of you know, um, it was long believed that relief of biliary obstruction um, prior to a patient undergoing uh, Whipple procedure or pancreatico duodenectomy uh, would reduce morbidity and mortality, and that jaundice was actually uh, a poor prognostic factor for someone undergoing a Whipple. So what they did is they took um, 202 patients with what was believed to be resectable pancreatic head cancer uh, based on imaging and clinical and, the, and with underlying obstructive jaundice. 96 underwent what they call early surgery, which was in one week, within one week of diagnosis. Um, 106 underwent preoperative biliary drainage with ERCP and placement of plastic biliary stints, um, and then underwent surgery later uh, after their jaundice resolved. Um, and they any complication, whether it was uh, surgical or non-surgical, uh, meaning endoscopic in the endoscopic group plus the surgical complications compared to surgery and serious complications were found in 39% of patients in the early surgery group and 74% in the biliary drainage ERCP group. Uh, mortality and length of hospital stay did not differ significantly uh, between the two groups, somewhat surprisingly, but it put to rest at least that routine preoperative ERCP in patients who are not going to receive uh, neoadjuvant therapy um, is not needed. And I think that was a um, hugely important uh, study in this area. Landmark article number seven, I break up into A, B, and C because they're all um, were published by Guido Castamagna um, and the A and B are really the same populations of patients. Uh, group C is sort of an extension of A and B. But basically, um, the landmark article really of reference is long-term results of endoscopic management of post-operative biliary strictures with increasing number of stints. This was published in Gastrointestinal Endoscopy in 2001, um, showing that um, placing maximal numbers of stints and progressive ERCPs up to five side-by-side -side plastic expandable metal stints um, had um, a very, very high success rate for complete non-operative resolution of post-operative bile duct strictures. Uh, the same group, of course, published their subsequent follow-up at 10 years, um, showing that for the most part, the response was sustained, and those patients who had recurrence of strictures could be treated again with the same uh, multi-stent uh, therapy uh, with excellent resolution. 
Um, and a larger cohort of patients was just published by the same group in 2020, uh, also using uh, multiple plastic pancreatic stents for treatment of uh, post-cholecystectomy uh, biliary strictures, specifically just those related to post-cholecystectomy. So I think that established what we do today uh, in placement of multiple plastic biliary stents uh, for treatment of benign biliary strictures. Um, interestingly, the, the next article uh, was published in, in 2016, um, also deals with benign biliary strictures, but looks at the effect of covered uh, self-expandable metal stents compared with plastic stents, a benign biliary stricture resolution this is a randomized trial perform, um, published in JAMA in 2016. Um, 112 patients were randomized to receive multiple plastic stents. That was 55 patients or 57, uh, a single covered self expandable metal stent, and they were stratified by etiology. Uh, endoscopic reassessment of the stricture was every three months in the plastic stent group where they took out the stents and re-injected contrast or every six months in the covered stent where they took the stent out and injected contrast. Patients were followed up to 12 months uh, after stricture resolution. The resolution rate in the covered stents group, stent group was 92.6% uh, with the mean number of ERCPs to achieve resolution lower for covered stents compared to plastic stents which um, you know, obviously makes uh, sense because the delivery system of a covered metal stent is only 7.5 French, um, and therefore it doesn't take multiple procedures to get up to uh, multiple stents uh, like you would with a plastic stent. Often um, you have to dilate, and maybe you can only get one or two stents in, and you have to bring the patient back for another procedure to redilate and get another plastic stent in. So because of the self-expandable nature, um, the stent can go in uh, with one procedure and be removed for a second procedure without needing multiple procedures. Um, this is just the Kaplan-Meier curve uh, for time to resolution of the strictures um, being uh, much shorter. Um, at, uh, it really breaks off at about 180 days compared to the plastic stents, uh, which required longer term therapy. Um, landmark article number nine um, is uh, spyglass single operator per oral cholangiopancreatoscopy for the diagnosis and therapy of biliary disorders, a clinical feasibility study published by uh, Young Chun, who um, passed away um, at a young age, um, and Doug Plaskow um, in Boston. This was published in Gastrointestinal Endoscopy uh, in 2007. Um, and it's interesting because this was obviously the first uh, use of a um, single use um, endoscope. And it was one of the really first reports of using a single operator um, cholangiopancreatoscopy or cholangioscopy system. Since prior to this time, cholangioscopes were separate scopes that required a separate operator from the, uh, the main endoscopist. Uh, some with dedicated mother scopes and daughter scopes. Um, so prior to this time, cholangio cholangioscopy was really somewhat problematic. Um, if you look on the left part of this panel, you have the procedure, patient and procedure data um, uh, of basically uh, 20 to 30, 35 patients, uh, indeterminate strictures, filling defects, uh, stone therapy, uh, cystic lesions in the pancreas, and gallbladder stent placement. Uh, they perform biopsy, stent, stent placements, balloon dilations, et cetera, that you can see here. Um, and the diagnoses on the right uh, panel of what they found. Interestingly, if you look at their images, you can imagine since this was a fiber optic uh, scope with uh, the fiber optic bundle being reusable, 
Uh, by today's standards, the images were actually uh, less than stellar, uh, but again, not surprising. Uh, but it shows that this has actually come a long way since then, and at least in the United States and most of the Western uh, world, um, single-use cholangioscopy has superseded um, other forms of cholangioscopy. And the final article, landmark article 10, I don't normally uh, cite my own work um, uh, as landmark articles, but I think this is very important. I think I, um, I chose this because I think the message is very important. And we published this uh, just over uh, two years ago, is EUS guided hepatico-enterostomy as a portal to allow definitive and integrate treatment of benign biliary diseases in patients with surgically altered anatomy. So what we performed was transmural access to the left hepatic duct um, via the esophagus, stomach, or jejunum in patients with post-surgical anatomy using fully covered self-expandable biliary stents. Um, and that allowed us a port to then downstream treat and provide downstream endoscopic therapy using ERC uh, techniques and endoscopes to resolve benign biliary conditions in 24 patients. These patients had stones or strictures or both. And I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a, a patient who um, had a um, ruin wide gastric bypass had extensive um, um, colitical ophiasis who needed urgent biliary decompression. Um, we initially had performed a left uh, hepaticogastrostomy. So in the upper left panel, you can see this is passing a forward viewing endoscope through that tract into the bile duct to perform um, mechanical, lift, um, sorry, uh, uh, electrohydraulic lithotripsy. On the right panel, we perform a uh, large diameter balloon uh, sphincteroplasty. Um, and then we, we perform uh, balloon antegrade and retrograde sweeping uh, to clear the bile duct out. And you can see there was a narrowing at the distal bile duct. Um, and we placed multiple plastic uh, double pigtail stents. Um, so this really has all the features uh, of the prior articles in terms of um, therapy of stone disease, cholangioscopy, uh, large balloon dilation or balloon dilation, balloon sphincteroplasty, and uh, placement of multiple side-by-side uh, -side plastic stints. In all these patients, we were able to resolve their disease and subsequently remove the stints uh, from the left hepatic duct um, um, and with follow-up uh, these patients have done well. So here's my overall reference list, which we can provide later of what I discussed. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Todd. That was wonderful. And uh, that, that took us uh, through the journey of uh, how ERCP evolved and how we changed the way we treat patients. Thank you very much. But you know, surprisingly, you. Uh, you know, seven out of 10 articles were from Europe. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, <laughs> you know that, that's surprising. Yeah, well, I think the, the Europeans have been ahead of us in a lot of ways um, in in the ERCP for sure. So that's true. Over to you, Chandrasekhar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Randir. And uh, you will agree with me: this the master's voice you have seen and the master's perspective on biliary endotherapy. Um, now I call upon uh, Dr. Murthy Badika to introduce the next speaker, which is none other than Dr. Vikas Chandrasekhar. Hello. This gives me great pleasure. First of all, thank you for inviting me. And it's uh, can you hear you me? You have to unmute yourself, sir. It's still I muted. Did. I unmuted myself. So you have to unmute yourself. You're not heard, sir. I did. I can hear, I can hear you. I can hear you. Todd, can you hear me? 
Yes, okay. Yeah, we all can hear you. So I think, I think I'm going to go ahead. Okay, so it gives me great pleasure. I know Chandra or Chandra Shaker for many years now, since 1993 or so. We met in Amsterdam, we were training there with KSI Brixa. So he is the founder and chairman of the and chief of gastroenterology at Med India Hospitals. Of course, he's the host now. And he's also founder of Department of Gastroenterology at Coimbatore Medical College in Tamil Nadu in India. He's a past president of Indian Society of Gastroenterology and Society for Gastroenterology Endoscopy in India. And of course, he's an international member of the American Society of Gastroenterology Endoscopy. He's adjunct pro professor at the Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR Medical University in Chennai and is a recipient of numerous awards. Of course, he is Master of World Gastroenterology Organizations. And of course, he is the recipient of the Community Service Award by the ACG. And that was probably the first time a foreigner or non-American was given this award. And that's something to be said. And he's also a recipient of a Padma Award, a Padma Shri Award, which is uh, a national award given by the president of India. That is, you know, high achievement. And Chandra, fascinating. You know, he's also a screenwriter. He wrote a movie. He is a screenplay <laughs> story writer, and he has many talents. And is so. It's uh, every time I see him, it's fascinating how he does uh, his medical practice. He uh, he does this without self-interest, even though it's a private hospital, so he caters to everybody, he takes care of uh, needy people in India. And I am honored to introduce Professor Dr. T.S. Chandrasekhar. Take the lecture. Yes, we are waiting for you to start. Yeah, yeah. See, how to talk after uh, Todd Baron is a big task. So I'm just, uh, just exploring that now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Murthy, thank you for your kind words. I am glad that you did not tell so much what happened in Amsterdam and all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Is my slides are seen there? Hi. My slides yeah, we can see Yeah, we can yeah. see your slides. That's okay. Um, okay. Randir is a master of uh, biliary endotherapy. Todd Barron is a world leader. And Murthy had been trained by Case Hubrex. He is the fantastic uh, biliary endoscopist. And other panel is also biliary endoscopist like Dr. KRP and Dr. David. Everyone is there. So I make this presentation after Dr. Todd Barron. This is a very difficult task. And this is the first time I've seen two topics being uh, the delivered, same topic being delivered in a two different perspective. And uh, this is going to be a complementary to what uh, Dr. Tad Barron has talked about, uh, biliary endotherapy. Luckily, we have a different perspective from what he has. He has then made a wonderful journey about what is happening in biliary endotherapy. I, again, once again, I bring warm greetings from Chennai, India. The topic assigned to me is 10 landmark publications in biliary endotherapy. 
I have to tell the story of 52 years of uh, biliary endotherapy in 10 publications. It's a Himalayan task. Why 52 years? Because ever since McCune cannulated uh, in 1968 till today, 2020, 52 years. If you ask somebody that which is your choice of uh, the best 11 uh, players in the football or world cricket team, everyone will have their own perspective. But ultimately, they will have the winning team. What is it? You just look at this team, if more of historical perspective, Don Bradman will be in the center of attraction, will be there in the. But if you do the current practice, current team, and Virat Kohli from India will be the, the center. So either you can choose a historical perspective or current modality or biliary endotherapy, what's happening. So I have tried to do justice, taking up some from history and more from the current modality of biliary endotherapy. Now I have to define here, what is a landmark publication? In my opinion, a landmark publication is a one which has created a paradigm shift in day-to-day -day practice, a new path finding effort, or a publication first of its kind, or the most cited article. I think Dr. Todd Barron has chosen from Lancet, NDJM, must have been most cited article. And I want to tell you here, apart from the original article, the multi-center RCT and systematic review with the meta-analysis also become a landmark publication in my opinion. So I try to get a mix up of all the thing here and to just justify my 10 landmark publication. So how did I do this? I searched in a PubMed in, we put it biliary endotherapy over 3000 articles and you have various variables you just start searching cholangioscopy, lithotrich, et cetera, over 1 million articles, both in Google Scholar and PubMed. So you will be convinced now, it is really a Himalayan task to get 10 publications. What I have done is here, I group these articles into four categories. One is biliary access, that is from what we wear, anti-grade PTBD to how we have traveled to retrograde ERCP. Now, presently we are doing the transmural or transluminal, whatever you call it, U.S. guided drainage, and a less controversial area where almost things are settled, large common belted stone and benign biliary structure, and the most confusion uh, the existing in this treatment of palliating malignant biliary obstruction. It's not the curative treatment, it's a palliating malignant biliary obstruction. So this is about biliary endotherapy. Had this biliary endotherapy not developed, or not advanced, we would have resorted either to the surgery or laparoscopy. And significant percentage of the population, I mean, uh, the patient requiring this biliary treatment have come to the now uh, biliary endotherapy arena. My landmark publication one is related to biliary access. Here I lean on to this uh, historical perspective of this. McCune cannulated, class and cavoid, they did a spintrotomy and electrohydraulic lithotripsy was developed by Koch and CBD standing by Sahendra. And there will be some overlap between me and uh, Dr. Todd Barron who has discussed and the uh, mechanical lithotripsy by Demling and papillary balloon dilatation by Starris and uh, laser lithotripsy was developed later on, biliary sums by my mentor, uh, Case Hubrex and U.S. Coldocodiodinostomy by Giovanni and last one quoted by Dr. Todd Barron is the spyglass. So I group them into my one first landmark publication because they all I have given the biliary access treatment. I just want to show you that you'll be very excited to see the original publication. And this is what it is now, a preliminary report of McCune on cannulating the uh, ample of water. This is both in Germany and in the English literature, endorsed by Spintrotin by Kawai and, and uh, the uh, Klassen. Here, Demling also here. And Demling has contributed enormously. And this is the development of endoscopy lithotripsy. This is a electrohydraulic lithotripsy, again from Erlangen, Germany. And the fourth one is CBD stenting by Sohendra, which he elaborated. I will not go into the detail because I am going to go for the other publication and mechanical lithotripsy by uh, Dr. Demling again. He had a tremendous contribution 
as far as the biliary endotherapy is concerned. Uh, this is the first time papillary dilatation was done by Starich. He is also from Germany and the laser lithotripsy. He did the ND ag laser. Again, there is dumbling is there. And uh, the biliary sums was by Case Hubrex from uh, Academy Medical Center, Amsterdam. Just to want to tell you a glimpse of this historical, uh, the, uh, the, actually these are the heroes who have developed the uh, bili I mean, biliary endotherapy and US guided duodenal, biliodiodal anastomosis by Giovanni and a spyglass as a feasibility study by um, Yong Chen from USA. Now, having said about these publications grouped into the landmark publication one, and I will salute these pathfinders. And Dr. Randir uh, he, he quoted that mostly from Germany, I mean, from Europe. I can tell you that looking at this historical perspective and the pathfinders, Germany has been the cradle of biliary endotherapy and Europe has been supporting very well. And these are the various institutions where the great stalwarts have worked. I just to get a feel of it. Now coming to this, how a pathfinder innovative concept and technique can evolve into a scientific publication is a very important thing. It is, goes into case reports and series and retrospective studies and prospective cohort studies. What is more important, we need to uh, have this confirmation by RCTs, then systematic review and, and, and meta-analysis, and we go for the consensus opinion. Now we always quote the Indian society or American society, societal guidelines. This has a award. Now I am done with this how the rest of the, this area have contributed for biliary endotherapy. This is going to be my landmark publication. So about the cholelocolithiasis, less controversy is there. Now let's see what are the players. Most of the stones can be removed by, retrieved by balloon or basket or mechanical lithotropes. Still 10 to 15% of the stones cannot be retrieved and we need to refer to the laparoscopic CBD exploration or open surgery. A two important procedure really made the difference. That will be my next two landmark publications. What are they? What is that procedure that reduces the need for mechanical electrotripsy? Mechanical electrotripsy is very good, but if there is a lumen filling stone, you will not be able to do it. And there is some limitation and there is some kind of uh, clumsiness also there what this procedure is, this balloon dilatation. So this becomes my landmark publication. This is from Kim from South Korea, reported in surgical endoscopy. And uh, the citation in the Google Scholar is around 120. He had taken 149 patients, first 77 patients with EST, sphincterotomy. Next 72 patients underwent large balloon dilatation. I know it is very difficult for you to observe all the detail. What I am highlighting is if, we are, if the patient has undergone large balloon dilatation with a mechanical lithotripsy, if the stone is more than 15 mm, the need for lithotripsy is much less with the large balloon dilatation. Number two, the requirement of endoscopy session also lower in patients who had undergone large balloon dilatation. So it is easy to, for them to conclude endoscopy papillary large balloon dilatation is an effective treatment for removing large or multiple CBD stones. This procedure may obviate the need for mechanical lithotripsy. So I am justifying why this is my landmark publication too. Now, what about the large CBD stone? We know that we have many players like electrohydraulic lithotripsy, laser and extracorporeal shock lithotripsy. And what is the one now coming into the, our armamentarium for today's practice is, this is a nice uh, systematic review, uh, came from uh, the uh, Paul Falcons and Joyce Well Group. And Paul Falcons is well known. And this Google Scholar, I just told you that 32 studies they've taken over uh, 1900 patients undergoing three categories of treatment, as I told you, electrohydraulic, laser, and shock of lithotripsy. Let's see the results now. The results, what they have taken is complete stone fragmentation, number one. Number two, complete ductal clearance, two. Number three, complete ductal clearance after first session. 
it is very obvious to note here laser has taken over taken over other two modalities so easier to me to conclude for the authors to laser lithotripsy appear to be the best successful advanced endoscopy assisted lithotripsy technique for retained biliary tract stone particularly the stones are very big i think this has uh, reduced the uh, need for going into laparoscopy or open surgery because of the laser and spike glass and the balloon dilatation so i am done with the if you see the current algorithm in the management of cbd stone and papillary dilatation of the ampulla and the laser lithotripsy through spike glass it really stands out so that we can reduce the need for surgery now dr todd baron has nicely put it customena how he brought it from the single plastic stent to multiple plastic stent and the, how he has gone into even after 10 years later also he could prove it that he reduced the need for surgery and the continuing effect after the plastic stenting so we have players like balloon dilatation which is reserved for only the i mean predominantly for the primary sclerosis and cholangitis single plastic stent multiple plastic stent what about the covered stems otherwise they need to go for surgery there is no doubt about it how we have taken significant uh, percentage of patient from surgery to biliary endotherapy the story of this landmark publication four what is this landmark publication multiple plastic stents or metal stent is my take so i uh, just take this uh, meta analysis you see most of the authors you know them uh, the mon kashyap and alexander epc and i have taken two publications where dr todd baron is the one of the authors and todd baron is here mohammad ali khan and this study says included 22 studies with over 1300 patient almost four or cities what they have taken is stricture resolution stricture recurrence and adverse events uh, how did they analyze resolution of benign biliary stricture comparing fully covered stems versus mps you see this uh, forest plot it is favoring the fully covered stems what about the other one number of years of recession needed in the treatment of benign biliary stricture again it favors the fully covered stems now it is very clear about even though historically costa magna has proved it 10 years later all the multiple plastic stent what is most important these authors have concluded have excellent efficacy in bbs management benign biliary stricture management it is as effective as mps there is no doubt about it but the requirement of fewer years fewer years cps to achieve clinical success is the one really takes me to the landmark publication four now i will go into the most uh, a little controversial uh, yes still confusion is existing how to resolve this with the landmark publication is my story now so i have taken six landmark publications for palliative malignant biliary obstruction the treatment options now surgery is curative but unfortunately more than 90% of the patient they come for palliative we have surgical bypass excellent plastic stent we do have and uh, sem self expanding metal stent uncovered and partially covered because fully covered is is now resort for the benign stricture now we have us guided biliary bypass stenting so where to choose how to guide our uh, people what is the current algorithm this is going to be the story of next six publications now there is a important thing really pendulum has swung from surgical bypass to biliary stenting it this study came from anderson published in gut this is from uh, denmark survival time complication rate and hospitalization requirements they have uh, assessed it and they have taken 50 patients now and this is the life table kaplan meier analysis the open circle uh, is the bypass surgery the one filled one is the endotherapy now you see this almost similar so the conclusion from this study is it has really a landmark because we were able to proceed into uh, into by the endotherapy palliation of obstructive jaundice nbo with endoscopically introduced endoprosis as effective as operative bypass so there is a very clear cut data now available now what is the landmark publication 6 now we are done 
we are convinced endotherapy is as good as surgery. Surgery is now eliminated for the time being now. Now you go for malignant biliary obstruction. We have two players now, plastic stent or SEMS. Plastic stent is cheaper. The cost of initial ERCP is cheaper. Then why to go for uh, metal stent? This was thought maybe one decade before. I think uh, Dr. Randir would agree with me in uh, Indian scenario, we will always uh, discuss why to go for uh, SEMS when it is not cost effective kind of thing. But this study is a multi cent I mean, the study has proved it. This is the prospective randomized control trial of metal stents for malignant obstruction of the common bile duct. And uh, the Kinrim mm -hmm. and the Vakil et al. This is uh, from a multi center study from uh, USA and Germany. They determine if SEMS offer improved palliation compared to conventional stents. 62 patients with CBD lesions were randomized to receive either uh, the plastic stent or metallic stent. This is a tabular column. I may not like you to go through everything. I just see this. Uh, those who had received a metal stent, in terms of cholangitis, re-intervention, hospital stay is much better with a metal stent. What we were working out, the initial cost of ERCP is offset because of the cholangitis and repeated re-intervention. So if you deploy the metal stent first itself, unless the lifespan is less than a month, that is a different story. But I'm talking about those who can have more than three to six months, the lifespan, the metal stent really scores over plastic stent. Now we are done with this, surgery is gone. And now metal stent, we have selected it. And now question is, this is the study has concluded uh, cost effective palliation. If you see the even stent patency also, metal stent scores over the plastic stent. And lesser complication, reduced CD intervention rate, reduced hospital stay. One has to look at the total life table analysis of this rather than taking out only the initial cost of therapy alone. Now, this is a very exciting thing here now. I remember we had several uh, discussion and Randir would recall how much to drain the liver. Some people are very happy draining one with one stent and they're very happy. And I've seen an enthusiastic interventional radiologist or endoscopy deploying as many as three to six stents also. So where is the guidance for us? What to do that? So this landmark public is a seven palliation is most effective, you have to know that prediction of drainage effectiveness during endoscopic stenting of malignant hilar stricture. What is the role of liver volume assessment? This is the retrospective two center study reported in GI endoscopy and 107 patients. They all had hilar tumors, bismuth two, three, and four, mind that where uh, very difficult to. Uh, a drain because unless you need a more than one stent. Anyway, what they have done is they had undergone cross-sectional imaging. What they have done is relative volumetry of the three main hepatic sectors, left, right, uh, right anterior, right posterior. If you recall, left to drain 30% of the liver volume, right anterior uh, drains almost 35 to 38%, right posterior drains 30%. So you have to know what is it. So what they have done is classified in three classes, 30% less than that, 30 to 50%, and more than 50% of the total liver volume. The outcome you have to decide any study. A decrease in the bilirubin level of more than 50% at 30 days after drainage. Let's see what they have found out. And it came in GI endoscopy. I will just make a circle here. Those who have drained, more than 50% of the liver volume, they calculated drainage effectiveness, uh, cholangitis and survival is better with those who have got drainage more than 50% of the liver volume. And this is again, the Kaplan-Meier lifetime shows that as far as the median survival is concerned, it is better with those who had drainage more than 50%. Now it is very clear that how will you do the 50% drainage? That's the conclusion here. Draining more than 50% of the liver volume, which is frequently requires bilateral stenting, is an important predictor of drainage effectiveness in malignant 
especially bismuth three halide structures and structures a pre ercp assessment of hepatic volume distribution imaging may optimize i think after seeing this article we'll start practicing that before draining we'll see the liver volume we discuss with our interventional radiologists and other the, uh, the diagnostic radiologists how how will you calculate it and we will go for more than 50% now now we are done with this no surgery no plastic stent more of metal stent we have to drain uh, liver 50% we need to have bilateral stenting now question comes we know that fully covered is a sword for benign uh, lesions uh, what about uncovered and partially covered uncovered is little cheaper than partially covered we know that but is there any advantage and uh, we were initially we were doing only the partially covered stents but then uncovered we were thinking that uh, there may be some problem and this study has settled the issue this is the study a randomized trial comparing the uncovered and partially covered cell expandable metal stent in a palliation of distal malignant biliary obstruction is a multi center randomized trial patient with inoperable distal malignant obstruction uncovered and partially covered outcome is time to recurrent biliary obstruction patient survival serious adverse events and mechanism of recurrent biliary obstruction this is a very crowded a uh, table i will not uh, you need not go through everything i just uh, make it those who had received uncovered sms compared to, i mean you just see the serious adverse events like stent migration recurrent biliary obstruction is more favorable to uncovered sms so the conclusion is even though there is no significant difference in time to recurrent biliary obstruction or patient survival between the partially covered stems and uncovered stems then what is a great deal because the partially covered stems was associated with no serious adverse events particularly migration so now we are resorting to uncovered stems now this is a very important thing we know that uh, bismuth 1 and 2 we usually do the ercp 3 or 4 we usually resort to ptbd so what is the landmark publication nine tells a word you are an endoscopy you are an interventional radiologist they do a fantastic job they have much more experience when compared to the uh, the uh, us guided drainage we know that very well still this landmark publication is going to throw some uh, light here what is the if you have a failed ercp in nbo malignant biliary obstruction which one will you choose so far ptbd has been the standard of practice now how us guided drainage can take over or what is the result so this is the efficacy and safety of us guided endo ultrasonography guided biliary drainage in comparison with percutaneous biliary drainage when ercp fails what is the study a systematic review and meta analysis you see the all the stalwarts here and uh, this is uh, the michael kale also in the one of the authors here came in gi endoscopy nine studies with a 483 patient were included in the final analysis now what is this forest plot to compare the clinical success favors the us bd and coming to this forest plot to compare the post procedure adverse events so we need to see the cost we need to see the success we need to see the adverse events and the feasibility and possibility what is your experience and coming to this this is what the thing they have concluded when ercp fails us guided intervention may be preferred over ptbd if there is a rider there ptbd is well established more interventional radiology is available you may argue like that very well but i think us also picking up very fast the rider is if you have adequate advanced endoscopy expertise and logistics are available usbd is biliary drainage is associated with significantly better clinical success and lower rate of post procedure adverse event and, and lesser inter reintervention this is how it is goes over and the last one is a very provocative landmark publication 10 i am a ercp person and i do comfortably ercp it is true with uh, dr uh, uh, randeer and dr uh, uh, todd baron everyone 
but now the question asked now here is and i will you as guided drainage replace ercp in mbo i was just want to tell you that dr tar baran is an expert ercp man but he still you want to learn us now he has mastered us also maybe he would have had the uh, the intuition that us also going to come up now so let's see this publication for that i have a preamble here if you deploy the structure across i mean stent across the structure there are three issues tumor ingrowth and number 2 is overgrowth and number 3 is reintervention you can obviate all these three thing if you deploy a stent proximal or away from the uh, structure this is the most important thing for that we have a multi center randomized clinical trial from south korean group what is the title us guided biliary drainage versus ercp underline the title is a primary palliation of malignant biliary obstruction the previous one was when ercp fails ptbd versus us here if you have a malignant uh, obstruction which one you will choose let me see this is a multicentric rct 125 patients the randomly allocated to usbd or ercp now in this i highlighted usbd patients had procedure time again i want to tell you here is if you need to have expertise so procedure time is much less with the usbd and reintervention is much less with the usbd this is coming up coming from a person who does maximum number of ercp in this part of the country but still i want to select this usbd as landmark landmark public in because the 6 months stent patency is uh, is better with usbd so they could conclude technical and clinical success rate were comparable between usbd and ercp substantially longer duration of patency coupled with the lower rates of adverse events and reintervention and more preserved quality of life were observed with the usbd now i will leave it to this uh, uh, for uh, this provocation to our uh, panelists moderators and to the audience listening so what is the take home message take home message one is as far as biliary axis we salute the landmark uh, pathfinders who have paved the way for biliary endotherapy as for the large cbd stores concern endoscopy large balloon and papillary dilatation has reduced the need for mechanical lithotripsy spike glass guided laser lithotripsy has established in managing large cbd stone and reduce the need for surgery and benign biliary structure fully covered is better than mph in managing bbs as a corollary additional thing is periodic dilatation will suffice for psc structure special stent kafi i have not covered these two papers it is useful in lt related liver transplantation related proximal biliary structure take home message two is endotherapy is as good as surgical drainage as far as the palliative malignant biliary obstruction is concerned and oh sorry and sms is better than plastic stent for biliary drainage at least 50% of the liver volume needs to be drained hence bilateral stenting is preferable uncovered sms is as good as partially covered but with the with an additional advantage of uh, less risk of uh, migration usbd seems to be better than ptbd again the rider is you need to have the technical expertise and the provocation is us approach in future may likely take over ercp as the preferred modality in managing malignant obstruction because of lesser reintervention so ladies and gentlemen what is our future we need to have data for photodynamic therapy rfe versus rfe five fluorouracil for prolonging the survival apart from sems i am expecting like cardiologists drug eluting sems and more procedures like um, us directed transgastric ercp by gallbladder drainage and hepatic gastrostomy needs to be standardized more refined techniques may be available we should work on that for complications free ercp it is my wish and artificial intelligence may throw some more light in this arena i when i asked all my colleagues who have been the faculty speaker they said they had to really sweat a lot to prepare this topic and i am very grateful for my colleagues who have given academic inputs from various looking at various journal so what did i learn now in the two weeks of toiling for this presentation if you want to be a celebrity in the landmark publication what i learned is you pick up an unresolved issue 
if you have a innovative thinking you will make a path breaking discovery if you have a institutional backup you will have you will have to go for multi center rct and if you are a beginner in the in your area and you will be very happy if you do it systematic review and meta analysis with this i thank you very much and thank you for your kind attention thank you doctor doctor sir most of the i request doctor uh, i i request dr murthy bariga to conclude the proceedings of the second talk so can you all hear me yes so it's it's fantastic to be part of this and uh, chandra and uh, all your colleagues in med india need to be con congratulated for this is a uh, you you are awesome you can get our president of our college to come talk to you and you can get todd baden from mayo clinic and all the biggies from india and uh, it is uh, this is a provocative it's, it's a nice topic and i like this uh, landmark publication review kind of stuff and i think it it puts in perspective where we are and where we should be going and what things to look for and i think it is it is helpful for the beginners and the experienced people and thank you so much for this wonderful <laughs> webinar and uh, hopefully you know we can do this physically like we used to in chennai and you used to make fantastic arrangements and we had a tremendous camaraderie with all the participants and uh, until such time we hopefully will beat this covid nonsense and we'll will be safer soon thank you so much for this wonderful webinar uh, thank you muthi for your kind words now i have uh, the learned panelist readily available now i call upon professor k r palanisamy to head the panel i request dr randeep sood uh, dr tod baren and dr green dr david greenwald and dr todd baren every one of dr joe solano to be there and we have question for all the panelists already lined up so i want uh, to start the proceeding uh, professor k r palisami already you uh, have received some question yeah yeah chandrasekhar i would like to uh, thank you for uh, taking me as a part of faculty in this uh, wonderful meeting and i would like to congratulate both uh, you and dr todd baren for uh, sort of a, for this excellent uh, review of this uh, topic Uh, on the the top uh, the landmark papers on the subject and first question is uh, there is one question to dr greenwald greenwald uh, as uh, usually we don't uh, give questions to the orator but this question is from united states by somasundaram bharat and this is uh, this question is from the public health point of view what can be done to improve uh, herd immunity is uh, green dr greenwald available Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear, you can hear me? I assume. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Actually, herd immunity. Um, we believe um, from the public health experts in the United States, and no reason to think that it'll be different in the rest of the world, will require about 70 to 85 percent of the population to be immune to COVID-19. So, in the United States now, um, population-based studies show that about 17 percent of the population. has antibodies that are measurable to covid-19 from infection so that leaves a long way to go before we get to 70 to 85% and the only other way to get there is with a vaccine so a mass vaccine campaign is the way to get to herd immunity and um you know that may that number may even be higher than 70 to 85% if these new variants um prove to be important and actually escape the vaccine so We um we do have a long way to go and we need to keep doing the the social distancing and masking and all of the things that have been shown to tamp down the curve um between now and the time that we reach herd immunity. Thank you Dr. Greenwald. The next question is to Dr. Todd Baron. Uh this is how how to choose between mechanical lithotripsy and laser lithotripsy. 
Well, <clears throat> I think part of it is what's available in your uh, unit. Um, um, it's between mechanical and, and, and uh, laser, is that what you said? Right, so mechanical obviously is readily available in almost every endoscopy suite. Um, and not all suites either have uh, the ability or do clangioscopy or, um, uh, you know, have, for example, laser or electrohydraulic lithotripsy. So I, I think it really is partly dependent on that. I agree with what uh, Dr. Chandra Shaker said in that uh, the first uh, approach for a, a large stone, presuming that's what most people use it for, would be large diameter papillary balloon dilation. Obviously, if it's an impacted stone in the cystic duct or one of the intrapatics, then that's really not the issue. It's not the size of the stone, but the location. And in those regards, then you would, you would really be more likely, obviously, to use one of the either electrohydraulic lithotripsy or laser because you can't even get around an impacted stone to, to do crushing. Uh, but for the large stone, I think number one is balloon dilation. Um, and then if you have, if that fails, um, you know, there are studies, I'll add one other thing that show if you go directly uh, to lithotripsy, uh, to electrohydraulic or laser lithotripsy, your procedural time and your success rate are higher than mechanical, uh, but in general, mechanical is, is very readily available. So it, it's a lot of factors, I think, that, that go into it. Uh, the next question is also for uh, Dr. Todd Barron. When should the pre-cut technique be introduced or taught to the ERCP trainee? So I, I allow my trainees uh, in ERCP to start doing pre-cuts uh, late in their first, in their year. We have a one-year training program here. Some centers are two-year programs, but most are one year of uh, specifically advanced endoscopy training. And I think it should be done uh, really late in the in the training of the first year, probably in the last one to two months, um, because I want them to get their really their cannulation skills, their dexterity uh, before they start doing pre cuts. But obviously, I want them to do it under supervision before they go somewhere else and have to do it on their own. Thank you. I think Dr. Chandrasekhar has a question. I have a question from Nepal. Uh, to Dr. Randesu, <clears throat> a patient has got gallbladder stone. Uh, can you unmute yourself? And he has got a pancreatitis, but CBD is normal. So how do you advise to approach them? And what is your take? You see, when you have gallstone pancreatitis and gallbladder, uh, you know, and the CBD is mm -hmm. has passed, then there is definitely no indication for an ERCP. And uh, uh, obviously, you will, uh, if it is a mild pancreatitis and there is not significant inflammatory response in the peritoneum, then the patient should have cholecystectomy before the person leaves the hospital. But if it is a severe necrotizing pancreatitis and uh, there's going to be difficulty in doing cholecystectomy and the other uh, issues of organ failure and uh, you know the inflammatory response uh, are more important factors, then of course, cholecystectomy should wait Till the pancreatitis settles. And in fact, uh, in our experience, gallstone pancreatitis, a severe necrotizing pancreatitis, we have seen that during the hospital stay, they have rarely recurred. And uh, even if when the gallstones are present, in fact, uh, we, we deal with a lot of gallstone pancreatitis and we, we find this is surprising. Uh, I don't know why it happens, but uh, we don't find that to be a pressing need to, uh, you know, to do cholecystectomy when there's a severe necrotizing pancreatitis. So that's very good. And uh, we have our colleagues who have just logged in from Kenya. I just want to introduce Dr. Hudson. Just say hello. Do can you unmute yourself? Dr. Hudson, unmute. And can you uh, uh, just want to ask some question, Hudson and Dr. Eric Murunga? Uh, yes, you want to ask some questions? You already sent it or I'll ask on your behalf. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you very much for- And both are from Kenya. They are a gastroenterologist physician and Dr. Eric is an American board certified and Dr. Hassan is a physician gastroenterologist. Okay, what's the question you want to ask the panelists? 
Yes, uh, so just saying thank you for this uh, excellent time that we're having and the great presentations. We're in a room here, so I don't know if you can see the rest of us here. So there'll be a few questions going on. You can see we are trying to be socially distanced and masked. And uh, so we are, we are many of us, others are participating uh, through the uh, online. Uh, uh, so my question, uh, then I'll also give a chance to uh, uh, Dr. Lodeño, is uh, directed to Dr. Todd Barron. Uh, what is your experience on uh, going for ERCP first in uh, patients with uh, hyla cholangiocarcinoma, especially of uh, bismuth three and four? Do you like to go for ERCP first or start with percutaneous um, access? Yeah, excellent question. Um, <clears throat> I still prefer to go to ERCP, but I'm very, very careful in how I select what I want to drain. So I almost always will get an MRCP first to define the anatomy because we know that once you instill contrast into a segment uh, that it needs to be drained uh, or at least the cholangitis. So what I do is that I very, very carefully say, what is it do I wanna drain and I do very limited contrast injection to get to the bifurcation. And there, thereafter, I use uh, angled wires um, and a knowledge of fluoro to know where, whether I'm in right anterior, right posterior, or left. And I've already chosen which I'm going to drain beforehand so that I very selectively get into those. And I only inject what I'm going to, what I enter with a guide wire well above the stricture. So I don't introduce contrast widespread um, and I very selectively then drain. Um, in those patients who, for example, I can get, let's say the right, but I can't get the left, I actually then go to EUS guided hepaticogastrostomy. That, that I know that's not available uh, to a lot of places, but I think to your point is part of it depends on the physician's comfort uh, what their expertise level is, because I think really for ERCPs to undertake a hyler complex uh, biliary case should be done by someone with really high expertise level um, in ERCP to, to do the kinds of things that I mentioned with selective cannulation. And if you don't feel like that's something that you can safely do, then I think it's probably better to go to PTC. But in my, in my hands, if they're referred to me, uh, we do ERCP with or without an EUS guided complementary drainage um, and use PTC as a last resort. And Dr. Randir, you have some difference of opinion? Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I don't unmute. have a difference of opinion. I think uh, that what Todd is saying is uh, when you have uh, a complete range of uh, endoscopic skills, you, you can approach uh, this way. What I was trying to comment upon was that we were the one, uh, I, we started uh, air cholangiography, uh, in, uh, you know, and we published in 2010 in GI endoscopy. What uh, we do is we go up above the structure uh, with the same intention, which Todd mentioned that we pre-select, use the MRCP as the roadmap, pre-select the areas we are going to, uh, you know, drain, go above the stricture with a thermo guide wire, uh, angle thermo, and uh, after that, aspirate the bile. And uh, then uh, we uh, put in air instead of dye. And uh, we, we uh, uh, you know, we selectively drain those areas and try to achieve more than 50% drainage and not venture into uh, se segments which are small and which are and not going to be fruitful and add additional liver volume to it. So that's how we do it. And uh, we we have we don't have that uh, good US skill to to uh, combine this. Uh, and uh, uh, I agree with Todd that if you can do that, you can actually left duct. You can uh, do it, and uh, you know EUS guided. Mm -hmm. And the question to all panel is Dr. Randir Murthy and Tar and uh, KRP. You, you have all facilities, Hylar 3 and 4, if ERCP fails, will you go for PTBD or US guided drainage? Uh, Chandrasekhar, I would uh, prefer US guided drainage. US guided drainage, yes. What about uh, Murthy? 
So we are probably we use more PTC than US, but we are we're changing. We're get, getting to be more US based. More US. So what about Indian scenario, Randit? Uh, you know, this this will depend on what have we done during the ERCP. If I have already uh, you know uh, put in stands and they are uh, you know they are not working and they, they, the US will be. Extra, the PTVD will be external catheter, be difficult for the patient to maintain, and they may not be able to internalize it. So then I'll prefer a US guided because less morbidity uh, uh, to the patient. And otherwise, uh, it, it will basically depend on the local expertise rather than uh, a, a clear cut uh, choice. What about uh, no, Professor Barron? Yeah. No, I, I again, I, I agree 100%. Uh, patients. We all know patients are uh, miserable whenever they have internal dr external drains. Now, if, if, you're, if you're fortunate enough that your uh, radiologist can cross into the duodenum, then hopefully, ultimately, those can be internalized, whether it be uh, the percutaneous approach or the endoscopist takes the uh, external drain and internalizes it. But as mentioned, sometimes they can't be completely internalized. So the goal should always be, even if you start with a percutaneous procedure, to try to get those drains internalized ultimately for the patient. So other question to Professor David Greenwald. Are you there? Can you unmute? Yeah. The question is, some of the good thing really impacted in COVID-19 uh, scenario, what is that impact that will be carried on forever? Well, I think there, I think uh, there will be a tremendous number of things that likely, you know, will be carried on forever. Um, the one that is probably the most likely to continue is um, some version of asynchronous care or telehealth. Um, you know, what form that takes is, uh, you know, remains to be seen. But, you know, this was something that had been, at least in the United States, was just about to be sort of unveiled in a big way. Um, because it really does benefit the patients who often have to travel long distances. I mean, Todd can tell you that he has people, you know, driving hours to see him. I mean, I would, I would drive hours to see Todd under any circumstances. But, um, you know, for patients who are coming, maybe not for a procedure, but for a follow-up, for them to have to drive many hours or in remote parts of the world have to go, you know, a long way, uh, certainly remote, uh, you know, visits are, are a boon. And, and the pandemic just forced that on us. And actually now we see it work. So if I had to say that's the one thing that I think will persist. Thank you. And question from my colleague from Kenya. You want to ask some more question you said, no, Dr. Eric and Dr. Hudson. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that uh, good uh, assessment of that question. And uh, I think uh, what you're doing here is pretty similar. Uh, a lot of us are starting with the ERCP for this. Uh, PTC is usually the next uh, more available uh, option if we have issues with that. Uh, EUSBD is also becoming more available here. Uh, Professor Ogutu is leading the way in that and that is becoming more and more accessible. So thanks a lot. Uh, so I'll ask uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Lodeño to uh, go ahead. Um, what my, my question would be, uh, what factors really influence the patency of this plastic stents? Can you speak a little louder since you are wearing the mask? What, what factors influence the patency of uh, plastic stents? Because they tend to have even less than half a period for uh, non-covered metallic stents. Do we know the factors can, that influence the yeah, patency? Yeah, I can take that. Um, well, in, in terms of distal uh, biliary obstruction, where it's been most studied, and, and obviously the data um, are very hard to come by with hyalur tumors because there's so many factors in defining stent patency. So um, it's, it's really from the distal option, but the first and foremost is the, the, the diameter of the stent that you can place. Uh, the larger the diameter of the stent, uh, the longer it's gonna work. And that's why uh, metal stents are better is because they overcome the limitations of the channel diameter of the endoscope. Um, we haven't shown that 11.5 uh, French is superior to 10 French. Um, so we fall back to 10 French. Some of the studies by Case of Bracey's group suggested that straight stints have better patency than, than pigtail stints uh, because of the, um, I think they used to say it was turbulent flow that promoted 
bacterial biofilm. Um, but other than that, they haven't shown that there are any stint materials, any medications, nothing else really affects the patency of a plastic stint than the diameter. Uh, Chandrasekhar. Yeah. Uh, there's one interesting uh, question from Nepal. Uh, which landmark publication has uh, contributed uh, the most uh, to the safe ERCP? Actually, both of us have not covered it. I think uh, he was involved. Dr. Tar, uh, Professor Todd Barron is involved. Do you want to answer this question? Well, I think um, a couple of things. One is, um, is when not to do an ERCP. Um, and that probably the landmark there would be the sphincter of OD patients, which may be just a Western diagnosis and disease, but thank God, or thank goodness that we've gotten rid of SOD type three. But I think also better imaging by CT, um, ultrasound, MRI, EUS, to identify patients who may not have stones that we thought have stones. I think that's very, very big. I don't know if I can choose one landmark article. And then probably though, as far as post ERCP pancreatitis, I would either choose the randomized trial of pancreatic stints that was published in gastroenterology by Tarnowski's group when he was with Cotton on prevention of post ERCP pancreatitis. I think it was in SOD patients and the use of uh, uh, rectal endomethacin as a randomized trial. Um, and lastly, probably uh, guide wire cannulation, uh, which is sort of later to the uh, table. Um, so I think all those together, the avoidance of uh, the ERCP, unnecessary ERCP, and the better imaging to select patients uh, and better techniques. I think uh, this is a question from Sitaram Nepal. So uh, I would ask him, I mean, I refer him to the complications of ERCP. The public landmark publication came from uh, Martin Freeman Group. And uh, three things now important to infuse oral before the procedure and the combination of uh, instead a uh, intrarectal and the, uh, the uh, endoscopy uh, pancreatic stenting can uh, really make the ERCP relatively safer. So what do you think, uh, Dr. Randir, this approach? Now, in, in India, most of us, we start infusing oral and rectal NSAD, and we have a, a pancreatic stenting if you have cannulated more than three times. So what is the practice you adopt, Randir and Murthy? Yeah. And in Apollo, what is that practice? Uh, what we do is that I, I seriously believe that there, we should do age, uh, a, age stratification of our patients because uh, we hardly see any significant pancreatitis in patients above 60 during ERCP. So in younger patients, we hydrate them well, the pre and uh, intra, uh, intra procedural. And uh, uh, if, we, if I have gone three times into the pancreatic duct, then rectal endomethacine is the standard of care. Pancreatic stent, yes, if, if uh, the uh, wire is, uh, can easily be placed and we are having a, a good access, not at the cost of uh, entering a side branch and uh, causing a rupture and trying to push in a, a stent. So that's our, our, our approach. And uh, uh, as I told you, if the patient is above 60, then you possibly just need hydration and you don't need uh, uh, any one of these. What about uh, Dr. Murthy from your center? How will you safeguard ERCP? So basically, don't do ERCPs when it's not indicated. The more normal people you approach, more pancreatitis. SOD does not exist outside of Wisconsin. These are general rules. Or as Casey used to say, it only exists in Racine, Wisconsin. That's a good thing to think of. So, yeah, I think uh, uh, Todd explained very nicely. So getting better imaging and not doing things. So how do you, um, if I have a direct Simple ERCP, I tend not to use endomethacin. Probably endomethacin is a good idea. Universally, perhaps people should use more of it. Fluid, I'm not so sure. I think fluid is a great idea. Now they're saying that uh, giving large volume fluids for pancreatitis is useless as a treatment. So we're all pushing fluid and then now there's a revision of thinking on that. So anyhow, so uh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, large volume is useless. 
what randir said is at least rehydrated hydrated so, so, yeah, no, i have no the oral, the, so, i think it's so endometriosis so selection of procedures and not avoiding young healthy normal yeah, pancreas to do ercps is a good idea uh, use better imaging get a good sense of what you're going to do beforehand use endometriosis give fluid that's what we do and my police from kenya so what do you do in kenya for uh, complication free ercp dr hassan and yerik we well most of our patients uh, are post ercp uh, we 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 use uh, endometriosis in uh, 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 suppositories uh, we don't routinely use uh, uh, insert uh, biliary i mean pancreatic stents to avoid uh, post ercp pancreatitis and in any case it's not very common here uh, we don't uh, most of our patients we don't see uh, a lot of uh, post ercp pancreatitis although uh, as i said we routinely use uh, endometriosis or Uh, analgesic other analgesic uh, so, uh, post ercp suppositories so you follow the standard protocol so you have any more question before i will take up some other questions or uh, dr uh, krp yes i so, in in kenya we do not have uh, extra corporeal short tube lithotripsy for mm-hmm. uh, for pancreatic uh, uh, stones okay some may be sharp some may be big uh, what are the modalities would we use apart from we may dilate the 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 main pancreatic duct but you sometimes it's not easy to achieve the dilatation required to remove those stones okay this is out of syllabus we have kept this webinar for biliary endotherapy we would answer that in uh, your email because we have lot of question related to do mistake me So the question from Bangladesh is biliary crystal. What is your take? We'll start from uh, Dr. Todd Baron. Yeah, um, I presume the question is biliary crystals related to patients with unexplained acute recurrent pancreatitis. Um, we do not. Um, we don't do that, at least at our center, and I don't recall that we've done it uh, much at all. I tend to take patients who have idiopathic, otherwise unexplained acute recurrent pancreatitis in an intact gallbladder, even if they don't have any imaging studies of stones or sludge, and send them for empirical cystectomy based on one randomized trial that was done in the surgical literature, um, because there's really not anything else you can do. I don't empirically do pancreatic sphincterotomy unless there's pancreas debesum. or a dilated pancreatic duct um so i don't do the crystal analysis uh chandra said there are a few questions in biliary stricture uh can i go ahead with the question uh this is how to retain stems in a benign stricture do you routinely use a double pigtail stent yeah, to prevent migration Um, so for my structures, I'll, I can take that one. I use straight uh, stents. How to, how to retain the stems in benign structures? Do you routinely use a double pigtail? Oh, I see. Yes. Oh, okay. So for self-expandable stents in benign structures, um, I, 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 I tend to use a stent that is, um, I won't mention specific brands, but there is definitely evidence that some stems migrate less than others. Um, I tend to use one that I think migrates less than I don't. I think it wouldn't be unreasonable if you've experienced stent migration to place a double pigtail stent through that. Um, although there really, as far as I know, there are not data to support that. It wouldn't be unreasonable to do. The next question is: uh, Should strictures be constantly di- uh, constantly dilated before stenting? What is the recommendation? Do you dilate the stitches before? If it's malignant, I think no. Yeah. Well, um, so if it's malignant, um, the answer is no, uh, with the exception of hyalur strictures, um, where just to technically place a stent, um, multiple stents, you may require dilating right and left to get 
two stints in. Uh, but for a single stint, for pretty much any indication, um, you shouldn't have to dilate the stricture. Of course, we do it for benign disease to either improve the stricture or to allow placement of more than one stint. But for most malignant strictures, especially even distally, the mechanical advantage is so good that you tend not to not, it doesn't technically um, really help the procedure to have to dilate. Thank you. Floor to Chandrasekhar. Yeah, uh, very interesting question uh, to uh, Professor David and it's not related to biliary, to Dr. Randir also. In COVID-19 time, how safe to do colonoscopy? Because stool excretion of virus is uh, for a longer period. So it is safe to do colonoscopy. What precautions to be taken? This is a question from Sri Lankan colleagues. Yeah, so there's some pretty good evidence that upper endoscopy is um, an aerosol generating procedure. There's very little evidence that the same risk applies to colonoscopy. Um, there's some data that suggests that stool, um, that uh, COVID sheds into the stool, um, maybe for longer than we initially thought. Um, but we believe, and if you looked at the guidelines that I presented during the lecture, that um, with appropriate PPE, assuming that's present, that you can um, you know, do colonoscopy without any concerns. We believe you don't need an N95 mask for that, for example. You could use a regular surgical mask, and that's actually what we do. So colonoscopy, so the way we do now, we screen all our patients. So COVID tested everybody. Of course, we have two COVID units with lots of patients. We do procedures in them as well. We N95 all the time, whether you're doing yeah. upper endoscopy, lower endoscopy, whatever. So proper PPE, testing the patients when it's available and taking extra precautions when they are COVID positive. That's what we do. Right, and we do, and we do the same. We, we test every outpatient um, within, ideally within three days of the procedure, uh, sometimes within five days based on availability. Um, and, and, uh, and that has been remarkably safe. Uh, and it you know, allows us to reassure our patients and our staff that, that we're doing the appropriate thing. We, in truth, use N95 masks all the time. Those guidelines um, are you know, understanding that may, may not be available in certain places. Um, and so we try to give some, some room to allow for a short supply and where you could use supplies and where you'd still be safe. The question from uh, here is 10% of the Hylar lesions can be benign. So how would you establish this like IgG, cholangiopathy, or tuberculosis in this part of the world. So what efforts need to be taken to establish this is not malignant? We'll start from Randit because he has done some work on that. And uh, I think uh, if it is a, a higher uh, malignancy, uh, first thing we look for is the cross-sectional imaging showing any mass. If it is showing a mass, it becomes easier whether there's a vascular involvement in it or not, that if it, there's a vascular involvement in casement or lower atrophy, we know that it's a malignant lesion. That, that makes it very clear. Then you don't have to unnecessarily, you know, go for cholangioscopy. But if it is a PSC where you are deciding whether uh, there is a over, over uh, the, you know, winning malignancy or there is a, there is a higher, uh, you know, malignant obstruction without mass, then cholangioscopy is very useful and IgG4 is the standard of care today if there's no mass. So IgG4 is uh, done in all patients of high, uh, hyalur blocks or even distal blocks without a mass. Do you like to add a Murthy or a Professor Todd, Baron? I, I agree. Uh, I'd also like to add with endoscopic ultrasound, um, you can often find subtle mass lesions that are not um, imageable even by CT or MRR um, that you can biopsy um, usually transduodenally looking up at the hilum from the duodenum uh, to get a diagnosis that way. The question, very uh, interesting question, Dr. Mohammed from Bangladesh is asking, lower CBD stricture, no chronic pancreatitis and um, CA99 is not elevated and no mass lesion, no lymph node, and LFT is elevated. 
how will you confirm how will you proceed no mass no lymph yeah. node well, you have to, you have to, right right you have to remember that a stricture there's there're very few idiopathic strictures in terms of um, if you've excluded all the things you mentioned, there's no history of surgery, there's no history of chronic pancreatitis, all those things you mentioned, and especially in a patient that's probably older than 50 or 55, you always have to assume that it's malignant uh, until otherwise proven. And um, I would say that the cholangioscopy is probably um, the best way to evaluate those strictures. EUS, I can tell you that we've also found subtle masses on the U.S. Um, that haven't been imaged otherwise and needled the wall of the bile duct and gotten a diagnosis. But I would say cholangioscopy um, and, and plus or minus EUS. And also understand that there are some patients in this day and age that still may end up going to surgery um, if they're surgical candidates because you can't establish without the shadow of a doubt that there's a malignancy or in those patients who can't go to surgery, it may be the test of time that over a period of time, it either expresses itself as malign malignant or not, um, but they can be very difficult isolated strictures to resolve as definitively benign or malignant. The thing is cholangioscopy is so difficult to get the lower end of the CBD. Yeah. So it may not throw some more light. So this is a difficult. What is your take, uh, Dr. Randit? Yeah, I agree with, where, you know, in lower end CBD strictures, yes, uh, a, a one condition which we need to rule out is a, a dominant PSC stricture, which is extra hepatic. And uh, I, you know, IgG4 cholangiopathy is another uh, condition. So these two need to be excluded. So uh, in such situations, a, a colonoscopic examination becomes a, a, a part of the workup with us. But uh, as Todd said, I, US is the next line of uh, you know, our investigation because uh, cross-sectional imaging can miss some small uh, tumors. If it's a very, very distal tumor, then one of the tricks we use is we do a peplotomy and lay open the distal CBD and can uh, look, uh, you know, take direct biopsies. So that's how we will approach it. We have 10 more minutes to wind up now. Dr. Yes, Murthy, we were discussing about lower CBD stricture. Uh, sir, one minute. Uh, Dr. Murthy, you want to contribute? We don't want to leave you. I, I had to take a Restroom break, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Can you repeat the question, Chandra? Lower CBD stricture, no mass, no lymph node, no chronic pancreatitis, no uh, history of surgery, and CA99 is not elevated. How will you proceed? But LFT alteration is there. Well, I mean, of course, I'll take care of the obstruction. And so you have to observe the patient for longer time, I guess. So... <laughs> The question asked is, will you go for surgery sometime? What you could not decide, you go for a Whipple's procedure and you confirm it malignancy. Does it happen? This is what the question from... Uh, yes, it happens, unfortunately, because I'm very leery of these kinds of uh, painless strictures, painless jaundice people with uh, strictures. Uh, idiopathic and other things are very uncommon. I would, I would, be, I would be very uncomfortable with this kind I of patient. Idiopathic questions to Randir and uh, start. Will you go for a uh, Whipple's procedure? You are not able to resolve this at all. Well, again, I have to look at the overall health status of the patient. Um, and I think if, if the clinical suspicion, and talk with the patient, right? Because their input's important and under, they need to understand that if they go for a big surgery, they may not have anything. And if they don't go for surgery and we wait, it becomes obvious they may have something unresectable. So I think it's a, it's a multidisciplinary discussion that you end up having uh, with the patient, the surgeons, and the family, that sort of thing, to determine what, what's the best way to go. But it's fortunately, that's very uncommon that you go into surgery now without a diagnosis, but it, it's a very, very small percentage, but it still can occur. Uh, I don't think I have to uh, add anything to what Todd said. Uh, we have uh, we will adopt the same approach that discuss it with the uh, patient and tell the pros and cons of uh, doing a Whipple and not doing it and uh, see the comorbidities in the patient, see the age and clinical scenario and what, what your, uh, your probabilities are. And if you have moved out IgG4 and uh, PSE and, uh, and this, there's a stricture in an elderly patient, 
then of course uh, the uh, ripple may be uh, a possibility in such a situation. Care uh, Pisa, you wanted to ask some questions. The role of RFA in the malignant uh, CPD obstruction. Role of role of RFA in the malignant uh, CPD obstruction. Um, well, I can answer that. Um, I'm not. Um, I, I'm sort of underwhelmed with RFA. I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, I, I mean, I certainly I'm not going to go against some of the evidence that it's effective, but um, if it's a non-resectable patient um, and you put a fully covered or, yeah, I mean, a, a expandable metal stent, you're not probably going to prolong patency of a covered metal, of a, of a metal stent, although uh, there are some that would argue with that. Um, you're not going to get the patient uh, strict stent free. I mean, yeah, you won't get the patient stent free with RFA and a malignant stricture. So you would have to believe the benefit, uh, if, especially if it's not near the bifurcation, you're not going to overgrow up the bifurcation. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm sort of on the fence to recommend it. I don't do much RFA anymore. Just to understand what you uh, Actually, there is a, um, definitely the, as for the evidence base. Photodynamic therapy added life expectancy. Hello. Ah, life expectancy to when compared to stents alone. And there is another study available where RFA has added the um, tumor in uh, invasion into the stents is lesser when compared to those who did not have RFA apart from only uh, stents alone. So stents plus PTD is better than SEMS alone. SEMS plus RFA is better than SEMS alone. And there's another study available now. Along with the SEMS, RFA, they've added a 5 fluoroiracil also. And the results, that's the reason why I put it in the future. We need to have more study to tell what Dr. Todd Barron has said very correctly. The data is not overwhelming. We still need to have more data but uh, how will you get data unless we practice this is and but seems to be some evidence that prolonging the survival but how much we need to have more data uh, let me add this. yeah let me add this. sorry the other thing is that with with the, the chemotherapy being so much more effective now for example for pancreatic cancer let's just use that as an example um, i'd have to go back and make sure that those studies were also done in light of some of the more modern chemotherapy and extension of life expectancy and tumor effects that may really be better than just local therapy, that the systemic therapy is just as effective. And last thing real quick is PDT is now in the United States when a certain company bought uh, the Photofrin, um, they raised the price from a modest price to exorbitant and it basically priced it out of the market. So if it, it, it's really not, I used to do it when I was at Mayo, it's really not feasible to do it anymore, at least in the United States. Uh, one more question to Professor David uh, Greenwald. Now we see the uh, variant of the COVID-19. Do you think there is going to have a a uh, very sinister and serious effect on uh, and humanity? Uh, it's a great question. So, you know, there are a number of variants that have not been reported and you really do have to keep up with this, you know, almost daily to see what's going on. The, the um, variant that's been ascribed to um, uh, being first located in Britain um, seems to be more contagious, but doesn't seem to confer any more significant disease. So um, people don't get sicker, but they get um, they get uh, ill. More, they're more likely to get ill. F to me, the main issue there is that that means that there are going to be more people in the hospital immediately, um, which tends to overwhelm our healthcare systems worldwide. And there's a whole lot of downstream effects on that. So to me, that's the most important um, aspect of that. The currently available vaccines at least reportedly are effective against that variant. Again, very early, there's not a lot of evidence. There are a couple other variants that have been now reported from other countries in the world, um, South Africa um, being one of them. And again, same deal with those, they, they appear to be um, you know, more easily 
uh, spread to other people, not clear whether they cause more severe disease. We're just gonna have to wait and see about that. Um, you know, and the, the last important point there is that this makes the vaccine campaign even more valuable and more important. The quicker we can actually get vaccinated, the less likely we are to be spreading these variants to each other. I think we have come to the end of this, sir. You have any more question? No, no uh, more questions. And any question from my colleagues from Kenya? Okay. Any questions from your side? Okay, I have uh, come to the end of the webinar. I just want uh, all the most of the delegates have uh, expressed that wonderful uh, lectures and wonderful oration by Professor uh, David uh, Greenwald and a fantastic voyage uh, the, um, as uh, expressed by Dr. Todd Barron and the exciting uh, Belir endotherapy, two speakers speaking on uh, one single subject in various perspective, it is a highlight. I just want to uh, have you a final word about this biliary endotherapy and COVID-19 from Dr. David and biliary endotherapy and landmark publications, your views uh, from uh, all the panelists here before we wind up. We'll start from Professor uh, David uh, Greenwald. What is your final message to the delegates here as far as the COVID-19 is concerned? Well, my final message, first of all, is to thank you all for um, honoring me with the Med India oration. And also thank you for just a wonderful panel. I've just so enjoyed listening to all of this and being part of it. We do all of these same therapies at our hospital. Um, and, and I agree, you know, we do what, what you all are saying. So it's encouraging to, to hear a number of international experts talking about these very common but difficult problems. In terms of COVID-19, I think the most important message is that science has really carried the day here. Um, that we've made unbelievable progress in less than a year. Um, and uh, you know, we've gone from understanding an infection to clinical trials to a vaccine and some effective treatments as well. And I'm, I'm more optimistic than I was a couple months ago that we can get on the other side of this. Uh, thank you, Professor David. And uh, I just wanted to tell you that large number of delegates have logged in from India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Myanmar and uh, Arab countries and USA. So this is the so the success of an August person because you had come here and uh, you all uh, had a nice discussion. And the question is the final message about the biliary endotherapy and the landmark publication. Murthy, your message. Uh, this is fantastic. And I think uh, I dig this better than some of our regular meetings, it looks like. So we, this, is, this is a fantastic focused review of uh, biliary endotherapy. And uh, I think you guys have done a tremendous job. I think we should thank uh, Dr. Greenwald for talking about COVID and, and impact on GI and, and society in general, and the optimistic note that science has carried today. And Dr. Tad, Todd Barron, of course, did a fantastic job of going through landmark publications. And of course, yourself, and this is, this is fantastic. And it's like, it's refreshing to hear all of this. And we can always, even, even the learned ones can learn more, certainly. And it's, I enjoy it. Thank you so much for this wonderful webinar. Professor KRP. So I would like to thank uh, TSC for this wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, meeting. And uh, definitely an excellent collection of, uh, selection of landmark uh, articles by both uh, you and uh, Dr. Todd Barron. And of course, we started from the basics and uh, uh, proceeded towards the advances. Uh, regarding uh, COVID, I would like to probably say, follow the three principles, hand wash, social distancing, and one more thing. Hand wash, social Hand washing, and- Hand mask, face so, mask. These, uh, are yeah. this, these are the three things you should follow always. Of course, correctly the vaccination. I have had the vaccination last Saturday. I don't know when. Did you have your vaccination, Sanjay? No, I'm going to have it off the webinar. I'm just okay. uh, waiting for that. And the face mask, my colleagues from Kenya, they're literally following. You just see that even in the webinar, I'm very they're, thankful. They're, they're sitting in a group. No, we are sitting alone. So that's why we are talking about that. Actually, we have a crew like this from Bangladesh and Nepal also. But I could not log in everybody. So I give a chance to my Kenyan colleagues. Uh, my colleagues from Kenya, you want to say something? at the end of the webinar? Yeah, just uh, on behalf of all of us here, the Gastro Society of Kenya and uh, a group that is here, we want to thank 
Dr. Chandra Seka, uh, Professor Todd Byron, Professor Greenwald, and all the other eminent panelists and organizers of this. Uh, this has been a wonderful conference uh, with a great deal to learn. So, Dr. Lodeño. Thank you, Professor Eric. Yeah. Ah, yes, you please carry on. Uh, very interesting uh, topic. We've learned a lot. Uh, what is uh, important is that uh, uh, COVID has affected all of us all over the world. And uh, the good thing is that it has not stopped the learning process, which still Professor, goes on. Thank you. Which, which still goes on as we as we are participate as we are witnessing now. Thank you very much, Professor Todd Barron, preparing for this lecture and uh, amidst your busy schedule. How did you feel, and what is your message? No, I I enjoyed it immensely. I I, I when I give it, what, this session has has allowed me to appreciate how lucky I am to have gotten into this field. Um, you know, I know probably there are a lot of physicians that may not be happy and I feel like I've been fortunate to, to get to the right path um, and to see it. I thought when I got started this and as a fellow um, and I got interested in this in 88 when Peter Cotton came to lecture uh, at my institution when I was a resident. And by the time I started, I thought, oh, I got into this field late. And I and didn't realize till you know recently it was I was actually early still within the field and had the privilege to see it uh, grow and expand um, and it's just really very satisfying to see what what has become of this uh, the field of uh, therapeutic biliary and endoscopy. Thank you, Professor uh, Todd Barron, and our man, Indian biliary endotherapist master, uh, Professor Randir Sud. What is your take? I, I, I think I'll simply say wonderful. The, uh, you know, everything has been excellent. And, uh, you know, the, uh, Professor Greenwald and uh, Todd have, have been exceptional. So uh, I, I, I don't want to repeat everything. And uh, the, I, I think I enjoyed my, uh, the, it was long time, but I still enjoyed it. So before we go for the formal water tanks, I once again, thank you, Professor uh, David. Greenwald and Professor Todd Barron and Professor Randir Sood, Murthy, Professor Joe Salano and Kerr Pisser. So now we'll go into the final uh, vote of thanks. Just two minutes after that, we'll sign off. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. It is indeed my privilege and honor to propose a vote of thanks and conclude this inspiring webinar. I should start by thanking Professor Greenwald, the president of American College of Gastroenterology, for delivering the MedIndia oration today, shifting paradigm in GI care. It was quite inspirational, sir, and heartening too, to see that indeed that there is light shining through the cloud of COVID-19. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful oration. Next, Professor Solano, a heartfelt gratitude to you, sir, for this lively moderation of this webinar and for conducting the proceedings smoothly as well as efficiently. And we were extremely delighted and honored to have with us Professor Todd Barron, a true legend in GI endoscopy. We thank you, sir, for an outstanding lecture. It was quite inspiring to follow the key landmark papers upon which biliary endotherapy has evolved. We do our, owe our gratitude to Dr. T.S. Chandrasekhar, the organizing chairman, anchor, and mastermind behind this webinar series. In today's webinar, we saw him don the additional role of the speaker. He has taken us on an amazing journey through the publications that have shaped biliary endotherapy as we know it today. We thank you, sir, for the joyride, and we quite enjoyed it. Our sincere thanks to our panelists, Professor Murthy Badiga, Professor Randir Sood, and Professor K.R. Parni Sami for their insightful comments and inputs. It was indeed a privilege to have you among us to share your thoughts and wisdom. And of course, I should thank my colleagues here at Medindia Hospitals, Professor M.S. Prasad, Dr. Gokul, Dr. Satyamurthy, and Dr. Sabri Nadan for the valuable guidance. I wish to thank our support team, Ms. Sasikala, Mr. Sasidharan, and Mr. Shiva for their impeccable arrangements and logistic support. And we do extend our heartfelt appreciation to our academic partner and sponsors, Microlab Pharmaceuticals, especially Mr. Jayaraj, Mr. Swakshar, Mr. Padmanabhan for their excellent support. And of course, we extend a wholehearted gratitude to you, the delegates, for your lively participation. Hope you've enjoyed the webinar as much as we did. 
We would be glad if you'd be able to join us for the eighth and final webinar in this landmark publication series, which is scheduled for the 20th of next month. You could catch all our webinar series live on YouTube, and the link would be shared with you very soon. Till then, from Team Med India, we wish you all the good health and joy. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we're expecting a book on all the eight webinars. And the book will be compiled from the first webinar, edition first to edition eight. And that will be given as a complimentary copy, as I told you, for ESG and uh, the members, and the ACG and ASG members of uh, Southeast Asia. So I would like you to share your slides. Already you have shared it. So we are going to have the book soon. And I will send you the books to you also. So thank you very much for this wonderful and sorry for holding you in the weekend. Thank okay. You. We enjoyed Thank as you. much as you did, I suppose. So.